Hey, it's Lisa Ryan. Welcome to the Manufacturers Network podcast. I'm excited to introduce our guest today, Steve Blue. Steve is president and CEO of Miller Ingenuity, which is a high-tech company in the transportation space. He's also the best-selling author of five books, and he's a speaker and consultant. So Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here. Steve, share with us a little bit about your background and what led you to doing what you're doing. I've been in manufacturing for 45 years or so, and in senior leadership in manufacturing for the last 40 and the last 25, I've been the CEO of a manufacturing company. So I know the landscape of manufacturers. I have written five books. One of them became a bestseller. I'm a professional speaker just in the last year. I spoke at Harvard Business School, the United Nations, and Carnegie Hall, just to name a few. And every now and again, I'll do some consulting, but mostly it's professional speaking, authoring books, and then running my own company, which as anybody at your audience will know, that's a full-time job in and of itself. So in the manufacturing, I know before you and I, before the show started, you and I were talking about company culture and you said that you've created a killer company culture in your company. And I really want to dive deep into that because with the workforce, with workers so hard to find these days to begin with, it's critical to create the type of workplace culture that keeps the people once you have them. So share with us a little bit of your philosophy as far as company cultures and then some specific things that you did within your company? First of all, in my view, culture is everything. It is absolutely everything. It provides a foundation for profit, for place satisfaction and shareholder satisfaction. And if you don't have the right culture, I can give you all kinds of examples of the wrong culture. One I would say, if you've ever traveled on an airplane lately, you know exactly what a wrong culture looks like. It's always amazing to me that just to use that example, Lisa, you get on an airplane and the flight attendants all work for the same people. They all work for the same company. They have the same benefits, working conditions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one will be absolutely miserable and the other one will be absolutely delightful. So it's hard to, and it all comes down to culture. In my company, we have several, I would call them tenets of culture that we believe in. One of them is community. Another is ethics. Another is excellence. Most companies, all companies should have foundational cultures. And then maybe your company might have a few different than mine. But people will resonate with the kind of culture that you have in a company. Now, if, if it's a crappy culture, and if it's a culture of, we'll just do what we have to, no more than we have to get along, that's going to attract a certain kind of employee. And it'll resonate with a certain kind of employee. But if you have a high performance culture, you know what I always say, Lisa, is every company should strive to have a Cirque du Soleil country, excuse me, Cirque du Soleil culture. Have you ever seen a Cirque du Soleil show? Yes, several. Oh, there you go. And I'm, I bet you everybody in your audience has. And the one thing you don't see in a Cirque du Soleil show is somebody going, hey, that's not my job. I'm not catching you today. I don't feel like catching you today. Or, they never grumble. They always come to work every single day, all jazzed up with a mission to do better today than they did yesterday. And I don't know why you wouldn't want a culture like a Cirque du Soleil culture. So a lot of CEOs tell me, we're manufacturing, we're, we're not a circus show. You can't compare us to that. And actually, you can. You can build the clamp planks and you can create the environment that will attract the, a Cirque du Soleil kind. Now, you have to make sure that to your point, that once they get here, see what we do, Lisa, is we're very careful in our screening. If you let somebody that has a bad attitude or doesn't believe in the kind of things that you're trying to do, you're caught, don't ever let them in because then they start infecting the rest of the place. And so not only do the leaders interview people before they come to work for us, the peers and people that they would work with interview them as well. And so then we get a read, is this person going to work with this culture or not? And that's how we keep them on the outside. And so once they're on the inside, you have to constantly promote and you have to constantly reinforce and support that culture. I'll give you an example. Every quarter, our employees pick a certain value of our culture and they vote for an employee that illustrates and exemplifies that value. 
And so they all collaborate on it. And, and every quarter we give an award to the person who won it uh, and they get a hundred dollar bill. And then we put a full page four color ad with them getting the award in our daily local newspaper. And wow. I can tell you that people love to see themselves in the paper. And then when they do, they brag to their neighbors and their friends. Look at this. This is the kind of company that I work for. And as an example, I don't have any trouble recruiting talent at all because the world around us in our community knows we have a high performance culture. They know we take care of our people. And when they see evidence of that, like that one example in the newspaper, it attracts the kind of people I want to attract. So how many employees do you have and what exactly does your manufacturing company do? We have about 200 people and we make everything from low tech products that go on the bottom of a locomotive and the bottom of a rail car, as an example, in passenger and in freight rail. And then we have everything from the top of that locomotive to the bottom. And then we move into the high tech space with LED highway crossing signals. We're the biggest manufacturer of those in the world. And our newest flagship product is what's called Zone Guard. It's a very sophisticated device that protects roadway track workers from getting killed. Believe it or not, if you see these guys working on the side of the rail, they're grinding the rail, they're clearing brush, all kinds of the stuff. A bunch of those guys get killed every year because the train, they don't know the train's coming and it runs them down. They have all kinds of procedures and policies, so that's not supposed to happen. So our product, Zone Guard, makes it virtually impossible for anybody to get killed that's on a track worker detail. So we're high tech to low tech and everything in between. Well, and it's interesting because when I was, when we first started the conversation, I, in my mind, was trying to figure out how many employees you have, because you make it sound like a small company, you know, that you can do these things and create this Cirque du Soleil culture and, and pick this the person of the month based on the values, but you have a good size organization. Uh -huh. So the challenge to people is don't make excuses that my business is too big or we have too many people to do this. Because no matter what size your organization is, if you bring the right people on board that you've already talked about, that screening process, and that does work. I've had a couple different podcast interviews, as well as just my clients that I've talked to as far as letting your employees get involved in the, pro in the interview process. Because otherwise, you have this person come in and he's got a great pedigree on paper but as a human being, he's just an idiot. You bring him in and your employees are like, I am not working with him versus they get yep. into the process. And before you even make the offer, your employers are like, if you hire him, I'm leaving. And then, okay, yep. not the right fit. Everybody looks good on paper. Never see the warts until they're inside the organization. So your point is well taken. The thing I want to say about an organization is too large to do all. Well, every company has, they, they break down... If you have a 10,000 employee company, it eventually breaks down to one leader with 20 people or one right. leader with 30 people. So don't tell me that in a big company, you can't do it. You have to make sure that your leaders are completely on board with the culture. And that's and then, the thing. Yeah. Yep. And then you charge them with the responsibility of carrying that out. And it really does have to come from the upper leadership and from the C-suite who sets the tone yep. for the organization, because if they're not buying into it, they it, then it's not going to happen, no matter how much a manager or HR or something wants to change the culture. It's really got to get that buy-in from above and all the leadership. I agree with you. This notion, I think somebody wrote a book about it once, leadership from the bottom. That's ridiculous. Yep. You can't lead from the bottom for crying out loud. And I, there's another book out, I think it's called Leading When You Have No Authority. That's bunk too. You have to have the authority, otherwise you can't lead. Now, if you want to lead credibly, you have to be a good leader, but you can't lead from the bottom up and the top has to absolutely buy into it. I'll give an example. I took over a company once that had a lot of problems. The culture was not what it needed to be. And it started with the guys at the top. So I brought them in a room and I laid it out for them. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we need to do. And if any of you aren't on board with it, you need to leave. Half of them weren't on board with it, even though they said, oh, yeah, sure, boss, I got that. But then they, in action, they, so I just fired them. 
And so when I did that, the other guy said, whoa, he's serious about this. And you, you start at the top. And if you got you, you train him, you teach him, you coach him, you cajole him, you encourage him, you support him. But if they don't do it, then you got to get rid of him. And then, then it resonates with the whole organization. When people see that someone was asked to leave because they didn't follow a certain value or a certain trait that we want for the culture, then they know the boss is serious about this, so I guess I should be. And you think about the commitment and loyalty that builds from the individual contributors as they're looking, because the, a lot of them don't believe that management will ever fire anybody in management, no matter how terrible yeah. the manager is. Yeah. So when they see the leadership team actually saying, we're going to change culture, and by the way, we just got rid of these five people who were toxic leaders, it really sends a very strong message to the rest of the team. It really does, Lisa, because you made a good point. A lot of times, upper management, they're untouchable. They, they are as what they are, and you can't do anything about it. And that's why companies can't change, because they leave the change the people in the top that aren't going to change and don't want to change. You have to you just have to take them out. You know, what happens is people don't become toxic overnight, Lisa. They become toxic wow. over decades. Usually you can't fix that. I've tried. Trust me, I've tried to fix toxic people, thrown everything you can imagine at it, but it just never works. So now I don't waste any time. If I run into a toxic leader or a toxic person, I just say goodbye. Yeah, it's funny. I just had a program this morning and one of the company leaders asked me, if I you know what I do when toxic people or how did he phrase it? Do you t what do you, how do you work with companies that have toxic leadership that want to hire you? And you've probably found the same thing, Steve, is those people don't hire us because they don't see the problem and they don't want to fix the problem. That's somebody else's thing to do. It's the companies that are already doing things well and want to do things better that are the ones that focus on things like company culture and not just the bottom line and how we're going to make the next buck. Yeah, it used to be you talk culture to a CEO and they give you that deer in the headlights look. These days, more CEOs are beginning to understand the power and, in my view, the absolute necessity of having a high performance culture. And so they work at it. I had a CEO once wanted me to come in and do a little consulting and he had a toxic team. He just had, a, I could tell... And I said, look, I said, I really don't want to do this, but I will. But only if you pay me my fee up front before I even start. He said, why would you want that? And I said, because I know within two or three days of me nosing around your organization, your team's going to come to you and say, you got to take this guy out. He's going to destroy this whole company because they don't want anybody to upset their nice cushy positions. Exactly. So I don't bother with, I won't bother with companies like that. I just, no thank. Yeah. I've had the same thing where you have to fire, you fire clients because they're just, they have the intention or it's something that they think that they should do. They've heard that if employees are engaged, then they could make more money. So instead of looking at it from the heart of the matter, from the actual culture and coming at it from that, what sounds woo woo, but that heart centered approach if you're looking at it as just dollar signs, then you're going to fail. But if you go in it with that heart-centered approach that I'm doing this because it's the best thing for my employees, it's the best thing for my leadership, it's the best thing for my customers, then you know what? You're going to be more profitable and you're Absolutely. going to be able to keep people and you're going to be more productive and all of the good things that go along with it. But we have to do the work. Yeah, most CEOs don't have the guts for the work because it's ugly and it's messy, at least in the beginning. Now, when you get an organization like I have, they run like a top. And I'll give you an example. One Saturday morning, I drove into the office to catch up with some work and I saw a big U-Haul trailer and truck at our loading dock. And I'm thinking that's weird because we always ship by commercial carrier and we don't ship on Saturdays. So my curiosity got the best of me. So I walk over and into the shipping department and there were some technicians there, a couple of factory workers there and one warehouse worker there, they're unloading a bunch of stuff. And I said, what are you guys doing? He said, we were short a couple of parts to make this certain commitment to one of our customers and we couldn't get it. So we called all over the country and we found them and then rented a U-Haul to go get them and brought them back. And, and I'm thinking, who gave them permission to do that? Well, the answer is they didn't need permission. And that's the kind of culture we have. They take it upon themselves and they do what has to be done. But that's where, that's the end stage. 
most CEOs don't have the guts to start it in the beginning where you have to fire people. You, I've had people threaten me. I've had threats to my family. I've had bricks thrown through my window. And all of that is part of the process of, of restructuring the, I guess I'd call it the heart and the soul of a, of a company. So what did the company look like? What were the specific things that you did? You were walking into a culture that was not what you wanted. How did you start? How did you cause that turnaround to happen? I'll give you a few examples of the mechanics, Lisa. One example, you see... How people behave is rooted in language, right? And so how they talk to other talk to each other by a large part determines whether they can work together or not and whether they can work productively or not. The factory, when I first took over this company, the language they used with each other was just, it would make a sailor boy. It was really bad. And so the first thing, very first thing I did, I called everybody together and I, in the factory, I said, here's the deal. I said, we will not tolerate that kind of language. I said, I'm not talking about hell. And I'm not talking about damn. You guys know what I'm talking about. And I said, there is no second chances. It's zero tolerance. First time you use that kind of language, you're going to get fired. Will be no warning. It didn't surprise me because I've been around a long time, Lisa. Within hours, they were testing me. And I fired three or four people in the first afternoon. Now wow. people started to pay it. You can't fire people for swearing. I sure can. And once I did that, and it, it took a couple of days for quite a few people to get fired, then the rest of the people said, wow, I guess we better not talk like that anymore. And I've always believed that the first place you have to start in a company, if you want to build a superior culture, is examine how they talk with each other and how they behave. So that was the first thing I did. And that second major, and this is, of course, the, over the course of a few years, you have to, first of all, find out what kind of culture that you have. Then you can decide, okay, because some parts of a culture you may want to retain. So we did surveys. I brought in an industrial psychologist, and we conducted surveys of every employee. I didn't ask them, the managers because they'll tell you what you they think you want to hear. I wanted to hear from everybody. So then we had a good sense of what our culture was like, and there were parts of it that were, yeah. This is worth keeping. And then we made a conscious decision in culture is rooted in values. We made a conscious decision. Here's the values the company has now. These values we don't want anymore. Here's why we don't want them. And here's the values we want. And in part, the employees told us the kind of values they wanted. Now, the inmates can't run the asylum, but I'd be surprised that most times employees, when you say, what kind of values do you want? They'll say, ethics, honesty, excellence. They really do because most employees want to really want to work hard if you give right. them the chance. So that's that was the second major thing we did. And then we threw everything we had against it. If you exhibit our values, you get promoted. If you don't, you get fired. If you exhibit our values, you get pay raises. If you don't get the pay raises, everything that an organization has, then you have to throw it toward the values and toward reinforcing your culture. And how do your employees, when you're going through the, if I were to walk through your plant and I asked your employees about your values, is that something that they know, like the Ritz-Carlton knows their theme? Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of companies have their values on the wall. Most of these companies are what I call a few, what I call bumper sticker values. They, they look right. good in the boardroom wall or they look good in an annual report, but people don't really believe them and exhibit them. We have them in our factory overhead from our factory. But if you were to ask any single employee what the values are, they'd be able to recite it. And one of the reasons they would is because we do everything to reinforce those values. Like I said, once a quarter, they nominate another employee for one of the values and then they get rewarded for it. And so everyone's sort of involved and aware of what we have and they like it. Yeah, wow, that's such a, that, that's such a good idea as far as the recognition piece. What about investing in your employees as far as personal or professional development? What do you do to help them to be better tomorrow than they are? In general, on the white collar part, they can go do whatever they want, take whatever they want in terms of courses and training and career enhancement, as long as it makes sense with what they're doing. In the factory, we have two, we only have two levels of people in the factory. Now, I don't, I won't have the name exactly down, right? But level one is really good people. And level two is like super good people. I don't know what we call them. There are two different levels. 
when you come in, you start off as like the really good or you can't stay. And we have a time frame and we provide training and coaching and encouragement. We want you to be the super level. And if you can't reach the super level in X amount of time, we'll nicely ask you to leave because we only want super level people here. So we plow a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort in improving the skills in our factory. And we do the same thing in the white collar ranks. We always want people to be the best that they can possibly be because everybody pays the same. Everybody, if you want to hire a software engineer, the guy down the street's going to pay the same thing as I do. If you want to hire a factory person, you can't outpay your way out of the employment problem. And so what attracts people to us is the, that they like our culture and our culture resonates with them. So when it comes to the resources that you provide to get those great people and the super great people to progress, is there like a, do they have access to online courses, like actually in the factory itself? Do you have a resource library? What are the tangible things that your employees have access to? In the factory, every person there that's not super, the super level, whatever we call that, they right. get coached. <laughs> They get coached by the leaders in that area. Here's what you need to be, do, and have to get to that level. And then they give them the experiences that they need. They give them the training that they need. If they need an online course, and sometimes they do, and you know how to re read prints better or whatever the case may be, they get that. And then the, in the office, everyone has, we have 100% tuition. Yeah. And we don't ask them to prove that they did it. Of course, I have to have receipts. I'm sure my CFO has to have receipts for the IRS. But generally we say, you go get whatever courses you want. If you don't have a, if you have an associate degree now, we encourage them and we'll pay for them to get a bachelor's degree. And just because the more educated they are, the more useful they are to the organization. So that's almost anything they want to do will support. And so when, and when you talk about that, that you're paying for their degree and master's degree, there's a certain percentage of people who are afraid to do that because they say, if I invest all that money in getting this employee a degree, then they're just going to leave me and all of that's going to go to waste. Yeah. So what would you say to combat that? Because I've, it's I've, I've heard the argument and say, okay, fine. You know, some, if you're not treating them properly and you're not paying them properly, you're not motivating them properly, they will leave. And that's on you, not on them. If you're motivating and paying them properly and treating them properly, they may leave, they may not. But while they're here, if you invest in them, they're going to be they're going to have better productivity than if you didn't invest in them. And I so I tell people to have that attitude because I've heard it before. Is you know what? Right. It's like McDonald's, right? McDonald's pays for like college for all their people, and then they go to work for Burger King. I don't know. You know that that's just an excuse, Lisa. In my view from people who don't want to pay, don't want to shell out that money and they try to justify that decision. Yep. Yeah. Is I had one of my, I had one of my clients talk about that they gave $1,500 a year to every employee to, to invest in whatever personal or professional development they wanted. And that was available. And yet only three to 5% of their employees took advantage of it. And so you know who the go-getters are. It's those three to 5% yeah. of the people who are coming to you and saying, hey, I got this flyer in the mail. Can I take this class? Hey, I watched this really great YouTube video. Maybe can I do a lunch and learn? Or mm -hmm. you pay attention to the people who are hungry because it's such a small percentage of the people that do that. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm a CEO in residence at the Winona State University. And as such, I get in and teach classes every now and again, but I always get a glimpse of people when they're freshmen. And I've been there for years, eight or 10 years. So I've seen a couple of classes of freshmen. I know who's going to be successful first time I walk into the classroom because they're engaged or they're not. And mm -hmm. the ones that are engaged, it's just a, it's really fulfilling to see them class presidents, they're in the student union, and then the next thing you know, they're graduating and they've got a big top job with a big company. And it's just really gratifying to see that. But to your point, you can tell who the go-getters are. The ones that are. And the other thing, and we're just starting to get to our end of time together, but you made such a good point of your involvement with the local college, with the local community college. Every community college has a workforce development and when you as a CEO are in touch with those kids and you're getting involved, 
with the college, guess who gets first dibs on those mm -hmm. fantastic people coming out of college? Mm -hmm. Too many people that are waiting too long for talent and they're expecting people to find them where it sounds like your people are finding you anyway because you have a good reputation for your company as a good place to work, but you also put the work in to find those new potential employees when they're first getting started in school. We do, and we're also heavily involved in the technical college in our mm. communities. We donate equipment. My VP of engineering goes over there and teaches classes. We do, what is it called, the co-op programs with them. We bring students in all the time to show them. I have a space called the Creation Station, and this is maybe, this is a topic for another time because it's a big one. So, so we can talk about this for a whole nother topic, so I think we need to have you back on. Yeah, we, we should <laughs> talk about uh, the development, you know, the development of our Creation Station. Anyway, we bring people in all the time and show them, here's what we did, here's why we did it, and uh, then we have that interchange between the students and my leadership and my employees. And that's usually beneficial to both sides. Awesome. As we are getting to the end of this conversation, if you were, if somebody listening to the show just really wants to get started and turning their culture around and they don't know where to start, what would be your very best tip? Here, here's the thing the you should pay people for one metric. There should only be one metric in your company that, that means anything, and that is profit. And in our company, we have, everybody knows what our profit budget is, and everybody knows every month if we're on target to achieve it or not. And at the end of the year, when we hit our target, everybody gets a bonus. They know how much the bonus is going to be. And if we don't hit our target, nobody hits the bonus. Nobody gets it, including mm -hmm. me. And that is the most powerful motivator you can possibly imagine. And I would encourage any CEO to have that one. Most companies have a million metrics and a million departments, and they're all at cross purposes with each other. When everybody's tied to one metric, I'm not saying you can't have others, one major metric, you'd be surprised how people work together when they might not otherwise. Wow. Steve, if somebody did want to continue the conversation with you, what's the best way for them to get in touch? I would say if you went to my personal website, stephenlblue.com, that's probably the easiest way you can, it's, link, it's linked to my company and there are all kinds of ways to get in touch with me through that. Okay, yeah, and I will also put that in the show notes with all of, with all of that. But Steve, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the phone. It's what a great conversation. So thanks for being here. It's been my pleasure, and I love to talk anytime on innovation and all kinds of cool stuff I, I can talk about. All righty. I'm Lisa Ryan, and this is the Manufacturers Network Podcast. We'll see you next time.